On this episode, we discuss the Ninth Circuit Court ruling on Enlist Duo, how to diagnose herbicide injury differences, and nitrogen production in soybeans. Stick around to see what Joe has for the corny joke this week. This is our last episode of Season 2. With the start of the new selling year, we start Season 3 next week. Make sure you're subscribed on our YouTube or our podcast to see what we have coming out for the 2021 season. Hi, this is Joe Mershman. Welcome to Cup of Joe, episode number 52, season two. Today we have Turk and Ben. Tommy is taking a little R&R. And uh, let's start with Turk first. Got some pretty big news this week. Yes, the NYSER court uh, give the nod of approval for enlist soybeans uh, to not vacate that uh, registration as requested uh, by the uh, um, the plaintiffs. So, as opposed to Dicamba that that was vacated, vacated yeah. in the Ninth Circuit. So the the only the only question they had was uh, monarch butterflies uh, addressed the aspect of monarch butterflies because they did not address the fact that that uh, DICAM or uh, enlist applications of, of milkweed in the field is going to kill them and uh, they said there is no adverse effects on monarch butterflies as a result of infield applications of enlist dual. So uh, they've asked EPA to make a correction to, to that registration but that was no, they, they said that is not a serious uh, problem and they expected that to be fixed uh, right away. So big news uh, for that. There isn't an issue uh, and uh, moving forward. So enlist dual can be applied and they found the EPA did all their due diligence correctly as opposed to the dicamba registration. Correct. So there's no stumbling blocks, no roadblocks to enlist dual being applied over enlist E3 soybeans for next year. None. None. So. Uh, we watched both court cases. Uh, we watched the uh, Dicamba court case and then the, obviously the Enlist Dual court case. And we came to the same conclusion that uh, the evidence was pretty, pretty overwhelming that the Enlist Dual registration, that herbicide registration, was done properly. So that's good news for American farmers that we're, we didn't lose another chemical uh, application uh, opportunity with uh, Enlist Dual. Nope, they're 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 moving forward. EPA, they expect EPA to make that correction on the infield application is to be not a problem, uh, very quickly, and uh, and we'll be ready to go. Great, that's great. Let's talk about this just a little bit. I'd like Alex to show the we we I guess in previous episodes you've gone out and videotaped. Uh, enlist injury mm-hmm. on soybeans and I would like Alex to pop up the the pictures right now of what enlist injury actually looks like we're getting lots of phone calls lots of uh, our agronomists and salespeople are going out and looking at at fields where where it's like well is this the enlist injury you know I applied my enlist you know four weeks ago three weeks ago the beans sh- are showing this symptomology and what we typically look at when we're seeing enlist injury is like the alligator backing the, it's more like the leaves are elongated um, on susceptible varieties and you know there's rumors going on that you know the enlist trait didn't get put in right you know when you spray the beans with enlist they start cupping because of the enlist application and that's just it's just simply not true yeah you know actually been turk and i uh actually were in the field uh where they made uh in in the process of uh putting a 2,4-D for example uh and uh the glyphosate and the glufosinate uh into that into that uh soybean uh, they it's inserted with uh agrium bacteria which is basically and, and they, they make several insertions and then each time they do an insertion, that's called an event. And they did over 300 insertions. In other words, 300 different, different times they put that gene of interest, the Enlist E3 gene, into a soybean germplasm. And then, and then they take those into a great big field, and it looks like a checkerboard. And then they start spraying uh, the various herbicides on at a minimum of two x rate and like Turk says they were going up to four and five x rates and then they observe what happens to that plant. If that plant gets sick, you know, obviously that event is thrown out and they find the strongest, most robust event and then they check it for yield and all the different things and that becomes the basis of the 
of the uh, the breeding program for the Enlist E3. So for some folks to say, like on Ag Talk, that well, some of these varieties on Enlist E3 do not have enough robust resistance uh, to 2,4-D or to glufosinate or glyphosate is just totally speculation because the the, the homework was done and Fifteen you know, the no, years ago? Yeah, Ten years ago? How long well, ago? Much longer than that. About probably over ten years ago. And and the thing is, 300 events, that doesn't sound like very many. Well, a lot of the traits that we're using right now maybe had two or three events to pick from. Yeah. So, I mean, it's it was, at the time, an unbelievable number of events were created in order to pick the very, very best one for tolerance to glufosinate, 2,4-D, and glyphosate. So... We feel extremely confident that there's not a problem with the, the, the tolerance of these products. However, that being said, with all the dicamba that's in this environment here, you, you literally cannot spray, get dicamba out of a sprayer. I mean, there's 80 gallons of between the filters, the lines on an average uh, Rogator, John Deere type sprayer. And even if when you do that constant flushing, it, it only takes one Ten thousand of an ounce to damage an acre. I mean, that's literally, literally an eyedropper dot dot in in a, in a sprayer. So, what you're running into, Ben, in my opinion, is is some other thing. Right, and that's where I kind of wanted to talk about. You know, what are we seeing with the 2,4-D? It happens. You know, we talk. We've talked about it's a contact versus systemic. So it's only going to affect the leaves that are exposed at the time. Um, you're going to see the alligator strapping. <clears throat> you're going to see quick recovery. So a week from uh, a 2,4-D injury on a susceptible plant, though, you're going to have plenty of new uh, leaves and stuff coming out. So it ought to be fairly easy to go out there and write that misnomer off okay so it, it probably wasn't this so now what are we going to go look at is there growth coming in the new or is there cupping or is there something coming in the new growth of that plant is there you know super bumpy leaves you know what were the growing conditions you know what was sprayed all around you you know it's you got to go through the, the the check marks and it should be a fairly easy uh thing to diagnose when it if it is a 2,4-D injury symptom absolutely and remember soybeans are naturally have very good tolerance to 2,4-D. Naturally, they do. I mean, they're as opposed to dicamba. You know, uh, you know, out of over 3,000 plants in the state of Illinois that were checked, soybeans were found to be the most sensitive to 2,4-D or to, to dicamba. Now, 2,4-D, the sensitive plants are, are grapes, uh, tomatoes, and there's a couple other ones. Cotton. That I mean, you, that's death to uh, on those plants if they get a whiff of 2,4-D. So, so 2,4-D has some, certain plants that that uh, are really sensitive, but soybeans are the most sensitive plant there is to dicamba. And all of those, all of those different crop uh, folks uh, were involved in the initial registration of Enlist, and they actually endorsed and signed off on it that it was safe for their crops. Yeah, so to, to compare the two products, even though there's, there's some common not commonality between them, it, they are definitely definitely uh, North Pole, South Pole when it comes to injury and, and uh, off-target movement and all the other things. So, And the fact that the EPA did all their due diligence as, as held, up, held up by the Ninth Circuit Court says that you know we, we're dealing with a pretty safe product and a product that if you follow the label, it, it, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a restricted use product. I mean, there's so many pluses for the E3 system um, that 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 give us the help, but the other thing you know when you're looking at those crinkled leaves and things like wasn't that many years ago, Ben? We used to burn the crap out of the leaves. You know, they right. turned totally brown, and and you know, hey, that's what we had to accept to uh, to, to kill, uh, weeds. kill weeds. Now we get a little crinkle on them. We go, oh my gosh, you know. And the reality of it is, uh, we got to think back uh, uh, back to before, prior 1996 and. And you know the stuff that right. we were putting on the beans, and they still yield a great. And I will, I will say that. I mean, ninety-nine percent of the cases that we go on, it's cosmetic. We uh, we used to mix up uh, Cobra. We didn't even need a foam marker when we go out with the sprayer. You could see right when you got to the other end of the field and turned around, you could see the welding going on, and you didn't need uh, or the burn going on. And you right. didn't need a foam marker. It was that that hot. Again. And we thought that was great back then because we were killing weeds and the beans still yielded. Yeah, and I understand the farmer's perspective. I mean, they got 
their livelihood invested in that crop and you know obviously you want to see that crop robust you want to see it growing well and you want to see everything perfect totally understand why the concerns are and we enjoy getting those calls and so we can go out and look at things and try to figure out what happened but there is a hormonal activity that occurs in soybeans too that when they're growing very rapidly they can get a kind of a crinkled uh, look Draw to strength. them too yep. yep so yep so i mean so some of this it may be that we're just kind of um, maybe a little super sensitive uh, to injury, uh, both on dicamba and on 2,4-D and other products, but that's okay. That means if we're looking at our fields, we're looking at things we're learning, and you know we all know that soybeans have this huge yield potential, but every little stress takes away that yield potential. So uh, a good farmer is looking at that crop and asking questions, and that that's great. Whenever somebody says my beans are cupped. We know it's not 2,4-D because 2,4-D does not cause cupping. It causes that those other symptoms, but not a cup. The the uh, we'll put the link up also again for the uh, Purdue differences between 2,4-D and dicamba injury that we had posted earlier uh, a couple of weeks ago. And I think again, if if you have this going on in your field, you have the opportunity to look at some some really good photographs from yep. uh, that Purdue uh, uh, handbook on 2,4-D versus dicamba injury. But the bottom line is uh, uh, I think we're off to a really good year as far as uh, soybean yield potential and uh, um, the interest in Enlist E3 and Liberty Link GT27 is growing every day as farmers look at their options and, and the yield's gonna be there. You know, it's bred by one of the, with. Uh, two of the individuals that have been breeding soybeans for over 52 years together. So that tells me that uh, they know what they're doing and, uh, and we're not, the yield is not going to be a, at all an issue uh, with, with the Enlist E3 and the Liberty Link GT27s. Right. We were talking about uh, going out and looking at soybean fields and I wanted to bounce one off of you in front of all of our viewers. We've had a in certain situations in certain spots we've had fields that are in low-lying areas the beans just didn't seem to grow for six weeks. Everything was put out of pause. You know, we had lots of moisture going on in the beginning part of our growing season this spring. Why would a bean plant in a low-lying area that may stay wet longer? I mean, what's your thought? Well, what have you seen before with yellow stunted looking beans that don't grow? Well, as you know, soybeans use a lot of nitrogen, right, Ben? You know, yep. I mean, what's the number? You know, do you know the number off the top of your head? It's like 300 some odd pounds yeah, is what so, it takes to grow. Yeah, and you know, and we, we just take it for granted, you know, that we're always going to have dark green soybeans because they make their own nitrogen. It was a few years ago, and I remember, Turk probably remembers the year, I can't remember the exact year, but we had huge rains in June, and, and, and basically we had a lot of water ponding. And what, what you do is when you take the oxygen away from yep. the, uh, the roots of a soybean plant, uh, where the uh, nodules are on, the, 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 the bacteria die. And it takes a little over 30 days for them to get back in shape. In other words, reestablished. So we had these soybean fields. Every low spot was yellow, big circles, and where the water stood. And then it took 30 days. And of course, once the the, the nitrogen fixing bacteria got came back to life, because you know that uh, then the, the, they they greened right back up. It, that's probably the number one thing see what Turk thinks. Well, again, you got to dig up, if you've got yellow soybeans, you got to dig up the roots, you got to look at them. If you dig them up and they have nodules on them, they should be pink. And when you squeeze that nodule, it should smell like fresh work dirt. I mean, you that, that nice aroma. If it doesn't smell like that, doesn't look like that, those nodules have died. If they're brown if or they're green or gray or green. anything else, they need to be pink and just squeeze it and smell it and you'll got, have that, that nice earthy aroma smell that, uh, and, and now you have healthy nodules and those will be uh, doing a great job for you. But if you don't have those, you have nodules, but they're not they're not that right color, then they have they have established and died because of a wet situation or cool situation. Got to have oxygen. I mean, they're they're a breathing, living organism, and if you don't have oxygen in the soil, that they will die. Well, yeah, Ben, and Ben, and you know, in in your agronomy 101 course you took, you know, what what do you, what do you got to have? You got to have you got to have water, and you got to have air, and then you got nutrients, nutrients and everything for that plant to grow, and if you if you take away one of those things, what happens to that plant? It's going to be 
submit to injury just yep. like so so we we took away the air which then knocked out the nodules and maybe even contributed to some potential of the root diseases you know that can right. establish yep. you know you got phytophthora is, is a good example and phytophthora can hit one plant here one plant here it can hit the whole row i mean it's hard to say because the, the fun, fungi actually swim to the root so there's a lot of things but i think for what we're seeing this year we're seeing uh loss of uh uh of the bacteria that form, make the nitrogen for the soybean plant. Yeah, we went on many calls two weeks ago now, and things are just finally, this past week, things are finally starting to kick back in, and that matches your 30, 45 day window yep. almost to a T. Yeah, so, so I just kind of wanted to highlight that a bit. So it has to dry out first, and then it has to reestablish. Correct. So it could take, it's, I think it's about 30 days for the bacteria to reestablish, but it could be a week or two in there for it to dry out. So good. So, and yeah, I, I I, th I think we're going to see some of that in the low line fields. And remember, in the month of May, also we had we were cool the month of May, so we didn't have a lot of vegetative growth in May, and that's another thing that's affecting the height of the soybeans. You know, if you remember two years ago, remember we had such a we had an extremely warm May, and we had all these tall plants, and we had all these problems with lodging. You know, this year the soybeans are fairly short, from what I can say, can see, and that's because of the slow start in May. Anything else, Ben? I think we're good. We've got a lot covered this week. Turk, how about you? I just wanted to touch on um, the Congress is looking at phase four coronavirus package, and they're talking about they're talking about a twenty million uh, dollar, uh, dollar aid package for egg and twenty million or 20, billion? Twenty twenty. The numbers are twenty so billion. Yeah, I think it is twenty billion. <laughs> yeah, I bet you. So it's, but it's a big number. I'm guessing. Uh, and again, farmers are farmers have. Uh, are struggling with commodity prices, but it seems like uh, the government is committed to helping farmers get through this period of, of bad prices. Well, I hope we all get through it because uh, it, it's, I think it's affecting the mental health of our country, this coronavirus, and you can just see it in the way the people interact with each other. I mean, it's just a scary time and uh, we just don't have all the facts sometimes. Yeah. So that leads me to this. That's the joke of the day, you know. And um, this one here, since Tommy told the ham sandwich into the bar joke last week, I thought, well, I got, I can't let him get ahead of me, so I got to come up with a good bar joke. This one here is about Dr. Jones, and he likes to stop at the bar after work and enjoy a almond daiquiri. One day, Dick, the bartender, runs out of almonds and substitutes hickory nuts instead. So the doctor sits down, takes a sip, and says, Is this an almond daiquiri, Dick? And Dick says, It's a hickory daiquiri, Doc. <laughs> you know, like the nursery rhyme, hickory dickory, Doc. Okay. Since that one was so bad, I thought I'd better come up with another one. And this one here is another bar joke. Guy walks into the bar and says, Hey, what's your Wi-Fi password? The bartender says, You need to buy a drink first. The guy says, okay, I'll have a Coke. The bartender says, $3. Then the guy says, there you go. So what's the Wi-Fi password? Bartender says, you need to buy a drink first. No spaces, all lowercase. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, we hope you had a good week, and uh, we hope your crops are doing well. We hope your family's safe. Thank you for your business. You know, we complete our fiscal year on July 31st, so right now our company's in the return modes and getting credits and getting ready for next year. We will be ready with pricing and roll it out to our dealers the first week of August, so we're ready to start this whole process all over again. So, see you next week. Thank you for your business. Take care.